One, by Frederick Weems. Melder looked at the lines on the wall. At first he thought they'd been painted on, but what seemed to have happened was that the painter had failed to paint in the parts of the wall which currently resembled black lines. The wall, about 10 feet high and 14 feet wide, was entirely beige except for the seven black lines. Starting about three feet from the floor, they were vertical, and each were more or less a foot and a half wide, and two inches or so in height. Each line was separated from its adjacent line, in the case of the one at the top and the one at the bottom, or lines, in the case of each of the first five lines between the top line and the bottom line, by three inches or so. Each line was almost the same size as any other line in the grid, but precision had not been achieved. The right-hand side of the grid was about 11 and 3 quarters inches from the corner, but of course, the lines not being uniform, it looked as if a seven-clawed rake had been swept across the surface when the paint was still wet. Is this on purpose? Melder asked. He looked around when an answer did not come. The person he'd been talking to was gone. Melder felt a certain abandonment. It had not been polite of his acquaintance to withdraw without telling him. All Melder had wanted to do was look at the lines on the wall. Why couldn't the person he was with say, I'm going in there? Am I not desired? Melder asked himself. He decided to go to the other room. There were two doorless doorways. What a picture of apprehension I am, thought Melder as he looked from one doorway to the other. Then a voice like the creaking hinge of the sky said, In awe, in awe, stands he. In awe of nothing, said another voice, which sounded like the sinking of the floor. Immobility defined Melder's attitude as either doorway beckoned him. What decided him, though, was not a sense of which doorway it was the person who'd been with him had gone through, but that he'd noticed a sign visible in the darkness behind the right-hand doorway. It was a red sign, rectangular and illuminated, saying, Restroom. If the person wasn't going to show up again, Melder would at least have an emptier bladder than he did right now. He crossed the threshold, looked around the darkened room, and started walking toward the sign. The closer he got to what he thought would be the restroom, though, the more indistinct the lettering became. As he was about to push open the door, he looked up and saw that the sign did not say restroom but merely featured awkward squigglings instead of letters. He pushed the door anyway, but it only moved a quarter of an inch. He pushed again. Again, it only moved slightly. Peeing was paramount. Melder had to avail himself of a receptacle. Is there a bathroom anywhere? He said a little too loudly, but no answer came, and although he hoped he might detect shapes as his eyes grew accustomed to the dark, he saw none. All he could see was the luminescent sign with its inarticulate lettering. Where are you? he called out. He did not even know the name of the person he'd been with. Receiving no reply, he walked toward the spot where he thought the doorway had Receiving no reply, he walked toward the spot where he thought the doorway he'd entered was. He put his arms before him, the darkness being complete, and walked ahead. Hello, he called, but other than his own voice, he heard no sound not even a hum from the lit-up side. It occurred to him that, although he'd seen two doorways before entering the room he now occupied, he might find an entrance to the companion room to this. The room with the seven lines in the wall had been a foyer of sorts. If the person had gone in the other doorway, it was conceivable that that person, nameless or not, might be waiting for Melder, who had not told that person his name either, in the adjoining room. It was possible the person had gone into that room and not returned to the foyer. Melder turned a full circle, keeping his arms out. He didn't bang into anything, but he couldn't tell how large the room he was in was. He couldn't tell where the walls were. Hello, he called once more and noticed no echo. Even sound was not going to give him an idea of the span of this room. He swerved so as to spot the red sign. He saw it, walked toward it, pushed the door below it again. Again, the door didn't move enough to let him enter. He moved his hand up and down to see if there was a handle. There was no handle. He put both hands against the door and sidled rightwards. Just past the door, there was a corner. Melder rounded the corner and put the side of his body against a new wall. 
That wall ended in a corner about five feet on. He rounded that corner, the next, and after the next, found the door again with its illegible sign. Realizing that whatever room was behind this door was sealed in a pillar in the middle of, or at least somewhere in, the big dark room he'd been lost in, was a comforting thought. The room he thought might be a restroom was lost in this pillar, just as he was lost in the surrounding room. He knocked on the door. He knocked. He knocked. He kicked. Not even his foot hitting the surface of the column made any sound. Why has my friend left me, he said to himself. He didn't say it aloud or even in a whisper. He didn't want anyone to overhear him. He also wasn't sure the person who'd left him had been a friend. He asked himself if there had been any connection. He asked himself this silently. This acquaintance had led him to this vast and empty enclosure. Melder decided it was time to leave. Walking away from the column which had the sign he'd thought said restroom, but didn't, he put out his hands, sleepwalker fashion, and walked. Expecting to bump into a wall any second or minute, he began wondering when this building had come up. His acquaintance had used the word decaying on the way there, but Melder didn't feel comfortable enough yet to say in what way. The friend, then, or acquaintance, if that, had no answer inasmuch as there had been no question. What decay meant to Melder might have a deeper or shallower meaning to the other person. Would the building be a pavilion from the Chicago World's Fair, whenever that was, and which it wouldn't be because this wasn't Chicago, or a Carter-era mall? Would the structure's promised decay be intrinsically interesting, as a grand building's dilapidation would be, or would it, be, or would it partake merely of the ironic, given a relatively recent birth? When the acquaintance or friend said, let me see if the door works, Melder had waited in deference to the acquaint friend's proprietary feelings for the structure. Melder thought about that as he continued walking, still with arms stretched before him. Hello, 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 he said, not as loudly as he wanted to. In the twilight outside this building, as the other one had run toward the door, Melder decided the building resembled a mid-century tire dealership. It was rectangular, like the anonymous building he worked at. Walking now, though, in the dark, with his arms outstretched, the faint smell of rubber insinuating its way into his nose, Melder could not believe the endlessness of this near sleepwalk. When the other one had waved him in, the front door yielding to a tug, Melder felt disappointment. This was not an interesting edifice. This is the surprise, Melder asked the one. Aren't we going to get winding staircases and beds with bloodstains on the pillows, straight jackets on skeletons? The one smiled without showing teeth and held open the door. Melder passed through, hating, though mute about it, the fact that this door was glass. Beveled glass he might have liked, but the website had pictures of rusted steel doors and splintered lintels. I paid sixty dollars for this, he almost said. He did say, the fixtures have obviously been removed. The walls are stripped. Yawn, he said. Something, he added, as if it were a terrible thing. Must have been against the wall those, uh, where those lines are. Well, a mildly interesting thing is that's clearly where a rack for tires was. I work for a tire place. See those lines? They painted the wall without moving the rack. The lazy fools. Just like where I work. So, what's interesting about this place? The one seemed to look at Melder mockingly. To sound more friendly, but also because of a need, Melder said, any working bathroom, by the way, that you know of? I got to piss like the proverbial racehorse before this spelunk. Vaguely disarmed by the similarity of this abandoned building to the one he worked at five days a week, and sometimes six, Melder studied the unpainted lines, but spoke all the time. I'm pee-shy. Maybe there's a lone corner I can stand in if there's no actual bathroom. In my place, there's one toward the back. I don't want to pee if people can see me through the glass door, or in front of you. I'll, uh, go to the back. Courage came to Melder. Is this on purpose? He turned toward the one, with as serious an expression as he could muster. This was when he noticed the one was gone. Melder mumbled on as he looked at the lines. The other person had vanished so quietly. In the pitch black minutes or hours later, Melder no longer cared where the one had gone. Where is the way out? shouted Melder. How could walking across a room take an eternity? He stopped walking. 
In a dark, empty room like this, he might as well relieve his bladder. About to unzip his fly, he couldn't find the zipper. He thought his pants were askew. He felt for the zipper right and left. He tried to undo his belt. There was no belt. He tried to tug the pants off. He lay on the ground in darkness. He was going to soak his pants. Melder decided to let go. It wouldn't come out. It was as if his bladder had no exit. Writhing on the cold floor, alone, seeing nothing but the electric jabs of pain in his mind, he began to scream. The red sign, moving right and left, left and right, as if someone were carrying it, became legible again. It did not say restroom. One's gone, said a figure with a mask over the mouth. Who's one? Melder shouted in a choking voice. The sign came nearer. You're the one, said Melder. He realized he was being pushed toward the sign. Shh, said the one. You're coming too. One, cried Melder. One laughed and took off the mask. One had bright teeth. Blinding lights hurt Melder's eyes. Others were pushing him toward the red illuminated sign. No admittance, it said, and then went off. One bent over Melder, leering. The others, step, the others stopped pushing Melder. It was as if he were on rollers. One, we thought there'd be two. Two what? Melder said angrily, sitting up, but immediately collapsing. Stones. You just had one stone, a big one. We thought there might be two. So, was this the house of horrors he thought it would be? Melder said, your website said this was an old psychiatric hospital. You said it was the best urban explorer's destiny on the dark web. Not our website. We're well health. I'm glad you looked us up. The others resumed pushing the gurney. Curtains parted and two glass doors opened out. Catheter for you for at least four days. You'll be back at work by New Year's. It'll hurt to pee for a while. Listen, with your $60 copay, you're going, you're giving me the 15% off four radial tires at Tireland. That's the New Year's sale, right? And then the one sang, should old acquaintance be forgot, one left the recovery room. As he lay on the soaked sheets, he heard the nurse say, House of Horrors, you're a pisser. The other nurses laughed. At least I can pee, Melder replied. Not without it hurting, said another nurse. It can't hurt as much as being a tireland, Melder said. But he was glad he'd have a week to watch the Urban Explorer videos that took him away from thoughts of the smell of tire particles and the always locked workplace bathroom he could never use in an emergency. And he'd never soak his pants while ringing up discount radials again.